Okay, so for the procedure for blood, right? So we gotta make sure we're not gonna get any ABO incompatibility. That's the worst situation that can happen, right? So we wanna make sure we have informed consent. They have to consent that there's, there's possible transfusion reactions. A, I can mess up. B, there could be inflammatory problems. And C, there could be uh, also non-inflammatory problems that can happen because of a blood transfusion, right? So informed consent needs to happen. And the exception is, of course, an emergency. Someone comes in, or they, you know, they, they hit their head, and they're not awake, and there's no one around. So is, you know, do we give them blood or not? It's like you can't have that ethical decision right there. So emergency needs are also are the only exception to informed consent. But if someone could give consent, they need to get uh, they need to sign the paper. And we gave an example of the informed consent here. Right? So here's an example from one of the local hospitals that has an informed consent on it. It says, hey, you are getting uh, blood, and this is the, um, usually on the back, I don't think this one has it, but usually sometimes on the back it'll have the, the actual, whole, all the different uh, possible reactions that might occur. But uh, the other piece is that you know, the physician needs to sign it, the physician gives informed consent, we don't give informed consent, we know what the, what's involved, that's why you're getting taught right now, but we need to, we, the only job of the RN is to do what for the consent? To witness what? Signature? No, we're not a notary. What are we? That they understood, right? They weren't under coercion. So the, the patient understands the, the, the risks and benefits of the procedure, right? They have to know, like, did the doctor say, hey, you're going to get blood? Cool. Yeah, cool, bro. And they, they fist bump. That's, that's not, they didn't explain the risks and benefits and alternatives, right? They have to say, hey, you're getting blood and we're doing this because your hemoglobin is low or you're bleeding out, you have a GI bleed. And, you know, the risks of blood are you can get, uh, you can get a transfusion reaction, you can get an infection, you can even get up, end up on the ventilator with a irreversible prognosis. That, that is a possibility. So they have to understand these consents. Okay, and if it is an emergency, it's usually two physician consent in California at least is, is what's, uh, what's required. All right, you have to get the blood. You can't just say, I'm giving blood and then blah, blah, blood, and it and arrives, right? It has, you have to get it from lab. Does it require a, a license to get blood from lab? No, anybody can grab blood from the lab. That is perfectly fine. But when they, that person does get down there, they're trained to make sure that they double check it. So they have to say, hey, you're getting blood for who? You're getting blood for, and this is, let's compare the blood band. So on the patient, there's a blood armband that they're gonna write on the little ticket on the blood, right? So usually someone's gonna go down with that information, right? You don't want them to go down empty handed. So we don't have an example here, unfortunately, but there's a, um, little worksheet. It's like a half sheet and it says, hey, this is the, um, and they write down the patient's information. They write down the patient's blood band number. They write down the, um, the reason for the transfusion and they go down with a half sheet of paper and they go down there and they say, I'm getting blood for this person and they compare their notes. So the blood product itself has all the information on there and the person says, okay, this is, this is the right person. Here's the blood. You can go ahead and bring this up to the patient floor, right? And once we get the blood, we're going to verify that it is compatible. And how do we know it's compatible? We're checking the patient's armband, right? That armband was placed under the most holiest of circumstances. So that when that armband falls off, you have to get, not a priest, but you have to get another lab person to come in and place it again, right? You can't just take off someone's blood band, right? Because then what if you put that on someone else's, someone else's wrist, right? That was put on and it's like a, like a fair ticket, right? Once you take it off, you can't, you can't use it again. Or I guess you could if you have small wrists, but anyways, you have to make sure that your that that blood product matches that blood band because they, what they do is they draw a patient's blood and they then go down to, and they uh, test it, right? And they say and they say, oh, this person is a positive, and they write a positive in the armband. They write the patients. They make sure all that stuff's correct, and they come up to the patient's bedside and slap it on there like handcuffs, right? And they make sure that it is that that patient is a positive. So that patient's been identified from now on, right? So. Uh, we got to make sure that that matches. So we're going to be checking everything back and forth, and we'll talk about the things that you check, right? So make sure you're giving the right product and make sure that uh, an independent double check is occurring, right? So independent double check happens in the lab when they get the blood, and it also happens up at the bedside when they, when they bring it up here. So that person, let's say, is our CNA or our uh, assistant personnel goes down and gets it. Can we do they check the blood with the patient at the bedside? No, it has to be another RN, another licensed individual. I mean, you could check it with a physician, I guess, but it's another licensed person, okay? So for even like LVNs, I think you have to get a special license for uh, a special additional certification for um, blood handling, right? 
but RNs out of school, that's why you're in school right now, what, that you're getting this lecture so that you are com competent at the bedside to then give, uh, to give blood and to make sure that it's the right blood. So when you give that, both URNs know about ABO and compatibility. Both of you guys know, hey, I'm giving this AB positive blood. AB positive blood can only be given to these people. Is this cool? Is that cool? Yeah. And that is um, hopefully going to prevent a blood transfusion reaction, right? So you're making sure they are ABO compatible. You check the blood band and the ID band. All right, so the blood bands here, they also have another, uh, you know, they have their hospital ID bands. We're making sure those line up. We're making sure that lines up with the tag from the lab. Right? Make sure this tag is accurate and matches. If it, what if it's not accurate? What do you do? Oh, they messed up. They, they know what they're doing. No, you have to go right back downstairs and they have to re-tag it. They have to retest it and make sure that's the right, the right thing. Okay, and what is an independent double check? Double check that's independent, right? So that means that, what does that mean? That means that you are, that you're not telling them. It's like, oh, you got Mr. Steve Wozniak there? It's like, yeah, is, is he born 72923? He's like, yeah, it is. You're, you're telling them their horoscope. It's like, oh yeah, I did have a good day today. That horoscope was correct. That's good, right? That's not, that, that, that you're, you're giving them information for them to, you know, to have their own bias, right? So they have, it has to be independently double checked. Both of you have to, uh, you have to compare notes, right? So that's the idea with independent double check here and also like with insulin as well, right? So someone who draws up insulin, it's like it's four units, right? Four, four, you saw four, right? It's four, huh? Four, it's four. And you show up your finger, four, four fingers. It's like that, no, it's, they have to check it independently and say, you got four units there. And you're like, yeah, I do have four units, good job, right? That's the idea of independent, independently double check. All right, so this applies. So 22 gauge is usually we have on stock. Technically 23 gauge is compatible. 24 gauge is not compatible. If you're doing, and then usually as a safety, some blood policies say 20 gauge, uh, just to be just to be safe. And what happens if it is too small of a gauge, too high of a number of gauge, like 24 gauge? What's going to happen to the blood? Or what's going to happen to the patient? You get hemolysis. Then what happens? Hyperkalemic. And then what happens? They get prolonged PR, prolonged QT, prolonged QRS, and then a sine wave, and then asystole. Right. So we got to make sure we are not causing hyperkalemia, okay? So it must be given with NS. Again, LR is on uh, is still still pending, but uh, NS is given. Both of these are isotonic, right? So these are things that are not going to make the cell crenate or uh, pop, right? So they can pop if they're if the fluid is too what hypotonic or hypertonic. Hypotonic, because the fluid from, from that, uh, the water from the hypotonic solution will move into the cells, including the RBCs, and they will pop. And then the potassium will come out, and now they have hyperkalemia. All right, so blood warmer may be needed. This is the fancy machine I was talking about. It's called, it's called a level one transfuser. It's a rapid transfuser. And you know, our IV pumps max out at what? What's the max rate you can put on a pump? It's like a calculator from the 90s. It can only go up to the number of digits on the screen. So it's 999. That's it. So 999 mLs per hour, right? So this our um, our pump here guy can go up to 1,200 mLs per minute, right? It can do what this can do in one hour better in one minute, right? So it's going to put that blood in immediately, right? It's going to it's going to go in right real quick and hopefully, you know, restore the blood pressure, restore the blood volume, whatever we need to do, all right? So then blood tubing. So blood tubing is just like primary tubing with extra steps. So it's like a primary and secondary built into one, right? So it has, you know, you're used to doing your primary bag, your TKO bag, right? And then you, you prime the whole thing. You prime with a saline. So the whole thing is primed with saline all the way down. And then once you cross-matched it, once you've checked it with the, with the, you know, with your nurse and everything, everything's good to go, everything's signed off, then we're going to spike our blood product, right? Because you don't want to spike the blood product, like, oh, it doesn't match, all right? Now you've wasted a whole blood product. You wasted someone's day when they spent one hour at a blood drive to, to draw their blood, right? So it needs to be, everything needs to be checked before we go ahead and spike it, right? And when we spike it, we're going to then prime the, the secondary line, right? And, you know, with a secondary primer, you usually have them, you know, one higher than the other. This one doesn't matter because you notice there's no chamber right here, but also there's, there's clamps on the lines. So these clamps right here, right? You, you get to choose what's gonna go in, 
right? Whereas the primary secondary, what, get, what went in was what was higher by gravity. Here you're clamping, right? So once the whole thing's primed, we're gonna clamp the TKO, right? We're gonna clamp that side. We're gonna open this side up, right? And now that blood's gonna now flow, right? Same thing with a regular ch uh, chamber, you fill it half full, you just could give it a little squeeze and now it's your, this whole chamber is half full. And it's not called a chamber anymore, it's called a buretrol, all right? So buretrol is just a fancy chamber, right? It keeps fluid in there, so you're not, you know, the air doesn't get down, right? You wanna make sure that's nice and half full at least. Okay, so as far as blood tubing, it's, it's changed every how often? Every four hours, right? That's the, that's the max you can, you can have it up and running. And then uh, the other exception is two units. So can you put a third unit on the same blood tubing? No. So if it's two units or four hours, whatever comes first. Because you could give a blood product over three hours if you wanted to, right? And you were not gonna be able to give the next one over three hours, right? You'd have to give the next one over one hour, technically. Okay, and if a blood product is 350 cc's, what rate would that one be over one hour? 350 mLs an hour, right? So that's usually most uh, facilities have a, a policy that says, hey, for the first 15 minutes, give it slow just in case there's a blood transfusion reaction, right? So we take, how do we know if a blood transfusion reaction? We take vital signs first, right? Because the vital signs that could change are your blood pressure, right? Can get vas it can get vasodilated. The blood pressure could go up if their fluid volume overload. And then uh, temperature is an important one as well. Temperature starts climbing over one degree. That's, and, and nothing's changed in the last 15 minutes except for this blood transfusion, right? So that could be a, an inflammatory reaction that could be occurring. And when you have inflammation, that's the SNS firing off, right? So now your heart rate and rest rate is gonna start to go up. All right, so we gotta check the vital signs before, 15 minutes during, and then we're gonna afterwards, and once it's completed. Okay, those are your vital sign checks. So at prior to administration, 15 in and at completion. So certain ones have different, pol certain policies are different. What do I start at, at 75? Do I start at 125? Do I start at 999? It depends on the situation, right? Sometimes it's an emergency. We are going to then start it fast, especially if it's tight specific or it's O negative. It just depends. Of course, you're gonna make sure you get a blessing from a provider. And again, we're observing for any reactions. And those reactions can be in the form of just a fever or it could be hives throughout their whole body. Right? or it could be like pain in their back. So we have to be able to assess well, what's going on and what do I expect the doctor to order? And if they order the wrong things, like you, 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 meant, you meant Lasix, right? That's what you wanted to give. So that's, you, have to, you have to give your recommendations as well. All right? And to give recommendations, we have to know what to give. Right? So ABO incompatibility is an important clerical thing that gets avoided by getting checked by lab with the type in screen by lab or the type in cross, when, the, when it says give one unit of PRBCs, that, you, that order goes to lab and the lab says, oh, I got one unit of PRBC right here, it's type specific, I'm gonna check it with what I have with their blood, right? And then if it doesn't coagulate, it's probably compatible, right? So that's the idea with ABO incompatibility. I don't understand light type compatibility. Okay guys, this little memory tricks. All right, so we'll try that again next time. I don't understand blood type compatibility. Okay guys, yeah, little memory tricks. Thing, sorry. So positive blood types sure like positive needed. people, they spread their positivity to other positive people, but they receive party invites and wedding invites from everyone because they're so yeah, upbeat and positive slow. and everybody wants to be around them. Versus negative blood types and negative people, whereas they bring everybody video, down. They give off and spread their negativity show. to everyone whereas they only receive negativity from other negative Nellies, right? Because negative people usually come together. Now, for universal donor, donor sounds like donut, donuts are O-shaped, O negative. AB positive is universal recipient, always be positive and you shall receive. <laughs> All right, so blood transfusion reactions. What are the complications of giving blood? So it's not just, you can't give blood to everybody. We have to make sure that like for hemoglobin and PRBCs, what's the goal for that? What's, when, when do we actually say, oh, it's, shoot, we gotta give blood? When they're bleeding, and what else? What's the hemoglobin uh, cutoff? Seven, right? Now, did I tell you why it was seven? Well, what's the reason? 
they like the number seven. That's the only reason. There, there's no actual saying. It's like, oh, you know, why, why seven? Did you come up to some scientific reason why seven? No, we like Vegas. <laughs> there's, there's no reason. All right, so seven because eight wasn't as great because eight was not a um, started having more reactions, right? So if you like nationwide lower from nine to seven, you're going to have less blood transfusions, so that you're going to save on on um, on on blood for one, so you're because blood's a shortage, but also you're going to save on blood transfusion reactions, right? You really need blood when it's less than five. You absolutely need to have blood. There's like no, you can't say, oh, it's seven plus or minus 0.5, you know, 6.4. Let's do the next one. When it's five, five less than five, then you can have an actual heart attack, All right? So that's that's you, that's the line in the sand officially. You can't go less than five. Either way, blood transfusion reactions. All right. So AFH is a quick way to remember the um, the uh, immune mediated ones. So the ones you're gonna have an allergic reaction to the blood. You have a febrile reaction to the blood or a hemolytic reaction to the blood. And we have a few other ones that we're going to talk about. But the, the key takeaway is that you're going to stop the, the transfusion. So once you identify that someone's having a reaction, you're going to stop the transfusion. Okay. And you can, when you get more experience, you're going to learn, well, shoot, they're going to they're probably going to order some this, this, and this, and maybe continue the blood transfusion. But you have to let somebody know. As a new grad nurse, you have to let them know that I need to stop the transfusion because I'm identifying that something's up, right? They have a fever. They have a rise in the respiratory rate and heart rate. They got a drop in their blood pressure. They have a like a, a allergic reaction with hives and urticaria, okay? So that's the idea with blood complications. So there could be immune mediated, immune mediated, or non-immune. All right. So immune means we are forming an allergic response or an immune response to our to the blood we're giving them. The most common by far is febrile. All right. So it's a febrile reaction. The the, fe the, fe the temperature is going up, and it's usually innocuous. It's like okay, cool, give them Tylenol. That, that's it. Right. It was uh, like supportive. Right. You can give them, you know, put some music therapy on. I don't know. But uh, we're gonna, you know, give Tylenol to help with the fever. And then we're going to then go ahead and continue the infusion. But you're not going to just going to do that. You're going to let somebody know. You say, hey, I got a, I got a fever going on. They're going to ask you what else is happening. You say, yeah, everything's fine. There's no rash. There's no, you know, there's none of this going on. There's none of that going on. Those are called pertinent negatives, right? You tell them they have a little, they have a one degree elevation of fever. Blood pressure is good. This is good. There's no distress. They have no back pain. They have none of that, none of this. And that is, oh, okay, great. Let's go ahead and resume the infusion, monitor them. Start start music, start the favorite music channel, and then go ahead and give some Tylenol, right? That's the most innocuous one, one that's not that big a deal. Allergic reaction is a, pro a problem. That means they have an antibody that we didn't catch. So there was, you remember I told you there's like 12 other antibodies out there besides rhesus and A and B, right? There's other antibodies out there that they could be having an allergic reaction to, right, because of that blood. So we, again, what are we going to do? We're going to stop the transfusion. And again, that's the theme here. Stop, stop, stop. All right, you're gonna make sure that they are, that we're not gonna to contribute to the problem. Okay, so allergic reaction. On the next slide, we're gonna go into how these happen, and then the worst one is by, uh, probably tied for for trolley. Is tro trolley not on here? So, oh yeah, it's the next one. Sorry. So tied for trolley. These guys are um, probably your worst transfusion reactions. They can lead you to die. Right? The ABO compatibility can make you die like now. So it's a, it's gonna, the patient's gonna be really deteriorate quickly in front of your eyes. Their blood pressure is gonna start to, to dilate. They're gonna have a huge immune response. They're gonna have a uh, agglutination response body wide. When you give the wrong blood product, they're gonna start attacking that blood, right? That 350 cc's of, cc's of blood, and that's going to cause a widespread immune response. Those little clots are gonna go everywhere. You go into the lungs, it causes a PE. You go to the kidneys, it causes them to, to start get occluded. They're gonna get back pain. They're gonna have a very, very bad outcome when you give it, have an ABO incompatibility. And then trolley. So trolley is a transfusion related acute lung injury. So that's when you give it blood and then they form a immune response against it. We don't know exactly how it happens, but we just know that it is an immune response and it leads to them having a, such an immune response where it's kind of like COVID. In COVID you had, you had an immune response to get COVID and it wasn't to attack the COVID, it's just your immune system went haywire. And then that, that storm of inflammatory mediators leads to, goes through the whole body and causes our lungs to shut down. It causes ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome. 
these patients usually end up on the ventilator and they don't survive because of the, they, it's just damaging all the lungs, inflaming all the lungs and causing their lungs to leak all kinds of fluid and pus and proteins throughout the whole body, through the whole lungs at least. All right, so then non-immune-mediated. So these are like an infection. They get infected with CMV. How do we avoid CMV? We take it out of the blood. How do we take it out? What was that treatment we did for RBCs? Remove the white blood cells. CMV lives in white blood cells. <laughs> Since we know that, it's like, well, why don't take the white blood cells out? They're not gonna get CMV infections, right? Sometimes we can't take all the CMV out. Sometimes we can have, there can be some residual left, right? Just mixed inside the PRBCs. And that's usually why you get a febrile reaction, right? But if they didn't take out the white blood cells, you could get an actual CMV infection and that can lead to uh, you know, maybe a day or two extra in the hospital. Hep B, Hep C, and HIV. So these Hep B is by far more common, but you can see HIV is all the way down here. As far, it's like the, the commonality of different immune reactions, right? Different uh, blood transfusion reactions. Okay, so you can see HIV or Hep B, Hep C, one in 21 million, right? Or one per million for Hep B, Hep C. For HIV, it's one in 21 million is, will get a HIV infection. Right, from, from blood transfusion. And that's been the fear, and it's still the fear nowadays. You know the last documented case of an HIV-related transfusion reaction was? It was like 1997. So that's like the last time it's ever happened. So in more than almost almost 30 years, it's not, not, not happened. All right, and that's at least America, at least. All right, then iron overload can happen, right? Someone with kidney disease, they don't make what? That causes anemia, that requires PRBCs. What, do, what don't they produce? erythropoietin, right, EPO. So they might need to get a lot of blood transfusions. Someone with sickle cell disease needs a lot of blood transfusions. So these guys are at risk of getting the complication of too many blood transfusions. And what is that? What, well, blood has, has uh, PRBCs, and PRBCs have hemoglobin, and hemoglobin is made of iron. So you can get iron overload from way too many um, PRBCs, and that's going to start clogging things. It's going to start getting every single organ system and start causing problems. You get the eyeballs, and you can see like a, the iris changes to like a little gold, gold color, right? You got gold eyes, like you know, you got too many PRBCs, right? And then electrolyte problems, so calcium or potassium, right? And which ways, which direction? That whatever, you, if you want to have some mnemonic for that, that's cool, but we talked about how it happens, right? And then taco, it's probably my favorite mnemonic that come up in a while. TACO, transfusion-associated circulatory overload. All right, they can say volume overload, that'd be called TABO, but TACO is so much, more, so much better. That's where you give too many PRBCs, right? Someone with CHF or renal disease, they're getting all this volume, they're gonna get circulatory overloaded, right? They're gonna get volume overload from way too much fluid you're giving them. So the treatment for TACO is to give what? Give diuretics, that's it, right? So give a diuretic after each unit. Give one PRBC and give diuretic and then give the second one. And usually it's frowned upon to give more than one PRBC at a time, right? usually, unless they're actively bleeding. Okay, so we'll talk about these ones on the next slide. So immune mediated. So these are all immune mediated except for iron overload. So iron overload is its own thing. That's where you get too much iron because you got too many PRBCs, right? So you get about, about 200 irons per PRBC. And when you get more than 20 units of PRBCs over a short period of time, three to six months or so, that iron's gonna start to get everywhere. The liver, the eyes, the skin, everywhere, and you start getting a nice cool bronze color, okay? You start getting liver disease, you get CHF, because the iron goes in the heart. You get uh, fatigue, because the iron goes in the muscles. You get diabetes, because the iron goes in the pancreas. So it goes everywhere, all right? So how do you get the iron out? You have to de-iron them. Is that you know, like a dry cleaning place? What is that? Well, de-iron means iron is F-E, so we de them, right? So you take out the iron out of their bloodstream with this agent that's going to chelate. Chelate is a fancy word for bind to, right? It's going to bind to all the iron, and it will hopefully take out the iron, okay? So the other ones are immune-mediated. That means that we had an allergic reaction to it. We had an uh, inflammatory response to that um, to that blood product, right? So allergic, that's where you are forming, uh, occurs within minutes. That's why in the first 15 minutes, we give it slow, right? And it's gonna, you're gonna start having an allergic reaction. So when an allergic reaction, they start, their throat can start swelling up. They can start getting uh, 
hives and they start itchiness, right, all over. So pruritus is a fancy word for saying itchy, right? You're not going to see someone chart, oh, they're itchy. No, they have, they, the patient has demonstrated pruritus, right, over the left flank, right? So they got pruritus there. And then they can get welts that form. And welts is not a uh, fancy medical term. So you have to say they have urticaria, right, or hives. So these things are developing over the skin. So this is the only transfusion reaction that has cutaneous mass manifestations. So that's the only one that has skin problems, right, is when they have allergic response, okay? We have allergic response, the inflammatory response, that's now the SNS is gonna fire off, right? So you're, what's gonna happen? Your heart rate's gonna go up, rest rate's gonna go up, it might get some, some sweatiness, right? And also you are going to vasodilate. You say, well, SNS vasoconstricts. Well, in allergic response, you start releasing histamine. And histamine vasodilates, and histamine bronchoconstricts. Our estes is going to try to fight that, but usually with allergic response, it's going to win. So you get a widespread vasodilation. So that their SNS response is not enough. So what do we have to do? We're going to hit them up with just some IM epinephrine. We're going to give a, the epinephrine to them to try to helpfully uh, stop the uh, transfuse that allergic response from getting out of control, that inflammatory response from getting out of control. Okay, we might have to give vasopressors to start from that widespread immune response. All right, so antibodies could be the reason why we're getting this immune response, this allergic response. Thing we didn't, we did, things we didn't detect when ahead of time. So we have to get specific antibodies testing done. It requires like when you order a blood product for these patients, it might take like 12 hours, 24 hours, even 36 hours to get the blood product they need. And when their blood's like hemoglobin is like 5.6, 6.5, that can be an issue. Can you can you survive for 36 hours before I can get that blood product to you? So it, it takes a second. Okay. And then febrile reactions. So febrile reactions are where it's very, very common. It might be some residual CMV. There might be some antibodies that might be attacking. It's not a huge response, but it's very, very common. You've got a fever that rises like a degree above baseline. They're going to get flushing, chills. They're going to have a headache. Malaise is like an inflammatory response also, but it's not as bad as an allergic response. All right. So they're very similar, the two, but one is just fever, well, just like a fever presentation. So again, the, the tr treatment is to stop the transfusion every time you detect, you, you see something that's happening, right? You detect this happens within the first 15 to 30 minutes, you're gonna see that response occur. And then ABO incompatibility. So ABO incompatibility is a clerical error. It shouldn't happen, right? But it can happen, right? So that's something we have to identify. That's why you're getting your RN license so that you are able to validate that, oh yeah, that is compatible. Because if you didn't, it's like, oh, I was, I was too busy, but, or as I, I forgot, so you can't forget when you're an RN, unfortunately. Okay, so it causes intravascular hemolysis and agglutination and immune response against everything. And it can clog the kidneys and clog all kinds of things. And it can cause uh, a widespread uh, vasodilation as well. And it's gonna be a, it's, it's almost a death sentence. It's the, the mortality is extremely high when this happens. So you got a huge hypotensive response. Yes, SS is going to fire off, but it's going to be a situation. Okay, they get hemoglobin that's going to spill into the urine, and that's something they can test. But and CVA pain, it's not like oh, that's stroke pain, right? No, a CVA is the costa vertebral angle, so between the costas and the vertebras, right? So the, between the spine and the ribs and the back, they're going to get back pain. So if someone gets back pain after a blood transfusion or during a blood transfusion, that should be a red flag, right? It's like, oh, why do you have back pain? Do you have a history of back pain? It's like, no. So that's, that's another red flag, right? Because a lot of people have back pain. And then transfusing infected things. So you transfuse CMV. It happens in one in 100 people, but that's why in the U.S. we standardize where we leuco-reduce things to get rid of the white blood cells because inside the white blood cells is your CMV. That's where it, it lives, all right? And then hep B, that's one in 100,000 people can get a hep B infection and a hep C infection as well. HIV is extremely rare. Well, it's not even rare. It hasn't happened in like 25 years at least, okay? So this one right here is depicting what? There's a hemolytic transfusion reaction. We gave the what? What happened in the hemolytic transfusion reaction? We gave the wrong cells to someone, right? We gave them, let's say we gave them B cells. So we gave B cells to who to cause a hemolytic reaction? <clears throat> to A, because A has anti-B, 
right? You form antibodies against what you don't have. So you form those antibodies, you attack those antibodies, your antibodies attack theirs, and then that's going to cause destruction of the cells, and that's going to start clogging the kidneys. It's going to start causing a lot of problems. And then this next one, what's this next one depicting? You've got an immune response occurring, right? So the antibodies that, that are, might be mixed in with the patient's blood can be causing an allergic reaction, right? Because standardized, standardly we, te we test for A, B, and RH, but there, there are 12 other antibodies that we could be checking for, right? But they take a long time to assess, and that can be causing a allergic response, okay? And then we got a hemolytic transfusion reaction again is, is where you get the wrong blood type. All right, so taco versus trolley. So there's our last slide here. So taco is where you have, this is, both of these being, both of these can end up where the patient's in the ICU and need to be on a ventilator. So they are very serious. Taco we can avoid by not giving too much blood, right? So we give one blood and then what do we give out between the units? So they wanna give two units. Give a diuretic. Also, we will give the blood slowly to these patients because they can't really deal with a lot of fluids at once, right? But if they start developing signs of fluid overload, what are signs of fluid overload? The blood pressure starts going up because you put more fluid into our already fluid full tank. So that's gonna make the blood pressure go up. They might get, you know, they might get some pulmonary edema as the, all that fluid starts building up. And it can't, it might go, yes, it might go in the, the dependent ex extremities. But it starts filling up the lungs. And what are you gonna assess on the lungs? Some crackles, right? They're gonna start getting hypoxic, and now we got an SNS response on our, on our hands. Okay, it can happen up to six hours after, but every unit is about 300 cc's, and if you're giving two units, that, that can start causing problems. All the fluid can start building up in the lungs, right? And that's gonna put extra pressure in there, and that's gonna cause some hypoxia to develop. All right, they're hypervolemic. Okay, BNP, if you assess that, that's released when you have too much fluid in your heart and that will cause that to rise. And then what else? Uh, trolley. So trolley is a severe reaction that occurs when you have a, um, a widespread inflammatory response to the blood. It's not exactly sure why it happens. We, we did all those steps right. We did all the APO, ABO checks, but they, they developed this within like six hours of the transfusion reaction, of the transfusion. And just kind of like with taco, it happens afterwards but it's going to cause lung injury from all this widespread inflammation. And it's not just like injury, like it's inflamed and red. It's like all this junk starts forming there. All kinds of proteins, all kinds of pus, all kinds of uh, fluids that build up in the lungs, which is a lot worse than just fluid, right? The lungs is fluid and pus and all kinds of junk in there, okay? And that's definitely gonna be worse uh, and more difficult to overcome. Okay. Either way, if you do see it during the, the, the transfusion, we're going to stop the transfusion. And that's the kind of the answer for everything, right? You're going to stop the transfusion. So the cause is a pulmonary edema, but it did not, it wasn't because the heart couldn't pump the blood forward. It was because the, it was a immune response that happened. It's called a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And we get a systemic inflammatory response. And that inflammation systemically can lead to a complication of trolley or even ARDS. That's what happens, like I said, with COVID or a severe, severe infection. You can actually get ARDS from that because this widespread inflammation led to inflammation everywhere, including the lungs. Okay. It's just supportive care. There's no real fix. You just got to hopefully they make, th make it through. Okay. So that's taco and trolley. So here's taco and the alveolus. We got all that fluid building up. Whereas trolley, it's all fluid, but it's also pus in there as well. Okay. Yeah, you would detect uh, a rapid response would be called as you know an emergency on the floor. The patient's not breathing good, right there. And why they aren't breathing good? Is oh, they got blood transfusion today. Like well, usually like an allergic reaction will happen right away, right? But it's like the timing wise, but it's also the severity wise. So we'd have you know definitely go to ICU to try to figure out what what's going on, what, what's the, what's, you know, what, you can do an x-ray as well. So an x-ray for someone with an allergic reaction, it's gonna look fine. There's not gonna be an, a, a lung problem, right? It's not fluid overload. It's not like a widespread um, inflammation and fluid through all the lungs, right? When you have an allergic reaction, but when you have trolley, it's gonna, you're gonna see that through the whole lungs. Okay, all right. 
So that is blood transfusions. All right, so B positive. We're going to take our quiz either now or, or later. It's up to you.